What up, y'all? This is your boy, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello, and you're listening to the Entertainment Report on iHeartRadio for Thursday, July 23rd, 2015, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the Entertainment Report with Ray Mello, that's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O, or on Twitter at the Enter Report. You can listen to the show anytime you want on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, search for the Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Real estate mogul and Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump tore into Anderson Cooper Wednesday for citing negative poll numbers and being dishonest. Trump said, I am leading across the board, and then you hit me with this poll that I didn't see before. Well, oh, gee, it's not even that kind of a poll. Trump then condemned the CNN anchor and the rest of the media. Uh, he said, the people don't trust you and the people don't trust the media, and I understand why. He also addressed his controversial comments and tone, telling Cooper he would probably change his tone if elected. And on Thursday, the Donald took to Twitter to take a swipe at Cooper. He tweeted, what a waste of time being interviewed by at Anderson Cooper when he puts on really stupid talking heads like Tim O'Brien's dumb guy with no clue. In a related story, John Stewart lambasted the media on Wednesday's Daily Show for continuing over coverage of Donald Trump, though the Comedy Central host admitted to somewhat getting off on the circus a bit himself. Trump's campaign has captured America's inability to turn away from man-made disaster, Stewart opinionated. He added that the news coverage was much like incensed and masturbation. Eventually, you feel a deep sense of shame. The comedian added, not enough to stop you from doing it entirely, but enough to slow you down a bit. This Trump gazing has caused us to miss the actual important breaking events, such as the recent nuclear deal with Iran, he said. If you want to learn more about the diplomatic victory, click on the Daily Show clip where Stewart dissects the deal, or just watch the video for the real reason you're here, the Trump online porn comparison. The Nightly Show contributor Mark Yard informed his boss Larry Wilmore that the black Republican vote is officially locked up and it's all going to be a surprising candidate, Donald Trump. Yard explained to the stunned Comedy Central host, this dude is 90s hip-hop all day. Trump's like gold, he rose deep, he has his own vodka, he got his own cologne, he got tons of baby mamas, he's had court appearances, and he's dealt with bankruptcies. The uh, political correspondent declared, referring to Trump's unauthorized use of a Neil Young tune, the dude is even jacking beats during the, Mog the Mogul's candidacy declaration speech. He already even called Trump's giving out Senator Lindsey Graham's cell phone number publicly straight-up gangster, concluding that, that based on all his beefs, the former celebrity apprentice host is the 50 cents of the Republican Party. On second thought, Yard decided that Trump was a bit more like Macklemore. That makes Hillary Clinton Suge Knight, and Macklemore is not beating Suge Knight. Actress Jenna Malone has signed on to join her Hunger Games co-star Josh Hutcherson in The Rusted, a short psychological thriller that Kat Candler will write and direct for Cannon's Consumer Contest Project Imagination, the trailer The Rap Has Learned. Hutcherson and director Ron Howard selected Tainted Water as the winning trailer and thus inspiration for the film, which will go into production this week. Tainted Water was created by Mark Mucurley, a college student from South Florida. The Russet tells the story of a brother and sister who, become, who begin renovating their childhood home into a recording studio when strange happenings force them to face memories of the past. The project represents a new genre for Hutcherson, who says that being part of Cannon's project imagination, working with Ron, Kat, and now Jenna, have really allowed allowed me to express my passion for storytelling. I'm excited to bring the vision of life as a producer on the project and acting up opposite a dear friend. Malone said, when Josh presented me with the script, I thought it would be fun to do something different together like a psychological thriller, and it was hard to pass a project with Ron Howard behind it. I also love that the film is part of this very cool creative experiment, tapping into consumers to inspire and elevate our imagination. Project Imagination, the trailer, is the third iteration of Project Imagination, Canon's ongoing initiative to empower creativity in everyone. The program, will, which launched in February, also marked Howard's third time partnering with Canon. Consumers of all skill levels were invited to create and submit 60-second trailers, and entry-level participants could utilize Canon's trailer editor tool. And in a related story, Lionsgate released a new trailer for The Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part 2, on Thursday. In the latest preview, Katniss Everdeen, played by Jennifer Lawrence, leads revolutionaries from the district of Panium into the capital to end the tyrannical reign of President Snow, played by Donald Sutherland. But Snow will not go, go down quickly 
quietly. He has booby-trapped the streets so that he can make a spectacle of the depths of those who would dare oppose him. The final installment of the movie franchise based on the best-selling young adult novels from author Suzanne Collins also stars Woody Harrelson, Josh Hutcherson, Liam Hemsworth, and Philip Seymour Hoffman in one of his final on-screen appearances. Francis Lawrence returns to direct along with screenwriters Peter Craig and Danny Strong. Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 hits theaters November 20th. In a new promo for E, I Am Cat, Caitlyn Jenner talks about her fear for the transgender youth and the responsibility she feels she has for them. It's 4.30 a.m. and Jenner can't sleep. Instead, she goes on camera to discuss the obstacles transgender youth face today, a topic she covered in her SB speech outlining various instances where young transgender people have problems with their transition. She says in the new promo, I feel bad that these especially young people are going through such a difficult time in their life. We don't want people dying over this. We don't want people murdered over this stuff. What a responsibility I have towards this community. Sans makeup, she reflects on whether she projects the right image and whether she says the right things. She asks herself, am I going to do everything right? Am I going to say the right things? Do I project the right image? My mind is just spinning with thoughts. I just hope I get it right. I Am Kate premieres this Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on E. The cable network Stars has acquired the North American rights to the action thriller Momentum the company announced Thursday. The deal comes after the film made its world premiere on Wednesday at the 2015 Fantasia International Film Festival. Momentum stars Olga Kurylenko, who starred in Quantum of Solace and Magic City, and James Pufoy, who starred in the following. Adam Marcus and Deborah Sullivan wrote the, co-wrote the script. The pair has previously collaborated on films such as Te- Texas Chainsaw 3D and Conspiracy. The film also marks the directorial debut of award-winning cameraman Stephen S. Campanelli. When Alex Kurilenko is an infant infiltration expert with the secret past, accidentally reveals her true identity during what should have been a routine heist. All right, uh, she quickly finds herself uh, tricked up in a government conspiracy and entangled in a deadly game, a game of cat and mouse with the master assassin played by Purefoy and his team of killers. On with her own set of lethal skills, Alex looks to exact revenge for her murdered friends while uncovering the truth. Star Digital planned to release the film theatrically and on demand this fall, followed by a Star's television premiere in early 2016. Star Digital recently released uh, releases included Diddle Montel's Bublar, starring Robin Williams, Roberto Aguilera, Kathy Baker, and Bob Oldenkirk, and Amy Burke's Every Secret Thing, featuring Diane Lane, Dakota Fanning, and Elizabeth Banks. Upcoming releases include Sean Mushaw's Tumble Down, starring Rebecca Hall, Jason Sudeikis, and Joe Magliano. MSNBC's Hard News Pivot continues as Chet Todd will return to the network to host a weekday show. An insider familiar with the situation told the rap uh, says the Meet the Press moderator will host a week lit, weekday political show that's a deep dive into politics in the 2016 election. The time slot and start date is not yet known. Todd hosts a daily rundown on MSNBC for years until his ascent, ascension to moderating the flagship Sunday show. The move continues the network's move away from opinion in favor of more traditional news. Other daytime moves are expected imminently with other opinion shows on the chopping block. MBC, MSNBC did not immediately respond to the rap's request for comment. Comedian Jimmy Walker is surprised by allegations that Bill Cosby drugged women, but he's not taken aback by the idea that Cosby was a womanizer. The 68-year-old Good Time star told TMZ that he still feels close to Cosby, but acknowledges that the star's career is over. Walker said, I love Bill Cosby. The thing that upsets me the most is that we're never going to see his work again because he's gone forever and ever, and it's unfortunate. Walker pointed out that he assumed it was common knowledge that Cosby had intimate relationships with numerous women, despite his on-screen persona as a family man. Walker said, I actually thought that everybody knew about about all these women. That's what I thought. He also added, the thing that shocks me the most is the drug, the drugging, because the times that I've worked with Cosby, I witnessed nothing with the drug thing. But the women, I knew about that. Dozens of women have publicly come forward since late 2014 with allegations of sexual abuse against Cosby, who has denied some of the claims and declined to comment on others. As the Hollywood Reporter first reported in an HBO cover story in mid-June, the, ES- the ESPN cast-off will make HBO his exclu- exclusive TV home. We're talking about 
Bill Simmons. At the time of the premium cable network, Simmons will launch his own talk show in 2016, the weekly show which will air on HBO's linear service as well as HBO Go and HBO Now, will be topical and spontaneous with stories and guests across the sports and cultural landscape. As part of the multi-year, multi-platform pack which begins in October, Simmons will also have a production deal to produce content for the network and its digital platforms delivering videos, podcasts, and features as he did at ESPN. PM. Additionally, the longtime sports personality will consult for HBO Sports, working closely with HBO Sports President Ken Hirschman on non-boxing related programming, including the development of shows and documentary films for the network. Michael Lombardo, the HBO programming uh, president, said in a statement, We have been fans of Bill Simmons and his work for a very long time. His intelligence, talent, and insights are without precedent in the areas he covers. We cannot be more thrilled for him to bring those talents to HBO and to become a signature voice at the network, spanning the sports and pop culture landscapes. Simmons added, It's no secret that HBO is in the single best place for creative people in the entire media landscape. For the moment, I started talking to Michael and Richard Plepper, HBO chairman and CEO. It was hard to imagine being anywhere else. The news comes nearly two months after ESPN Simmons home for 14 years unceremoniously dumped the prolific on-air online personality whose other uh, contributions include Grantland, popular podcasts, and the critically placed 30 for 30 documentary franchise. Simmons following, which includes 4.3 million Twitter followers, was no doubt of appeal to HBO, which is looking to grow its stable and let's see personalities in an increasingly on-demand era of TV viewing. Theodore Beichel, a prolific performer and political activist who created the role of Captain George Von Trapp in the original Broadway production of The Sound of Music and defined the role of Teve, the milkman, during more than 2,200 performances of Fiddler on the Roof, has died. He was 91. Beichel died of natural causes on Tuesday morning at the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, publicist Heron Bowl announced. Internationally renowned and respected as one of the most versatile actors of his generation, Michael received an Academy Award nomination as Best Supporting Actor for The Defiant Ones in 1958, where he played a Southern Sheriff. Uh, Conservant in a number of languages, Michael's background and versatility led to wide multinational range of roles, often playing authority figures. The native of Vienna starred as a Dutch doctor in The Little Kidnappers in 1953, a German submarine officer in The Enemies Below 1957, a French general in The Pride of the Passion in 1957, Russian military man in the in Friuland in 1958, and The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming in 1965, and a Hungarian phonetics expert in My Fair Lady in 1964. Other memorable features credits includes The African Queen in 1951, I Want to Live 1958, See You in the Morning 1989, Crisis in the Kremlin 1992, and Child Conspiracy in 1996. In The Sound of Music, which opened on Broadway in 1959 and ran until 1963, Michael earned a Tony Award nomination for his work. The musical also starred Mary Martin as Maria. Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer took their parts in the 1965 version, movie version, which won the Oscar for Best Picture. On television, Michael made a hundred of appearances, co-starring as Herring Kissinger in the 1989 ABC miniseries The Final Days and guesting on shows as diverse as The Twilight Zone, Gunsmoke, All in the Family, Law and Order, Jag, Columbo, and Star Trek The Next Generation. He had recurring, he had recurring roles on the primetime soap operas Dynasty and Falcon Crest. Beichel did a weekly radio show at home with Theodore Beichel, which was nationally syndicated, and he was the author of Folk Songs and Footnotes and his autobiography, Theo, which first published in 1994. Pop star Katy Perry descends upon the Taylor Swift Nicki Minaj Twitter, Twitter exchange with a scolding hot message of her own. On Wednesday, July 22nd, the day after Swift and Minaj traded comments on Twitter regarding the MTV Video Music Awards, Perry posted on Twitter, Finding it ironic to parade the pit women against other women argument about as one unimmeasurably capitalizes on the takedown of a woman. For those not reading between the lines, Swift messaged Minaj on Twitter after taking offense at the rapper's comments about her exclusion from the VMA's video of the, of the year nominees. I've done nothing but love and support you. It's unlike you to pit women against each other. Maybe one of the men took your slot. Swift posted. However, Swift's most recent number one hit is Bad Blood, a song that she has admitted is about feuding with another female pop star that is widely presumed to be Katy Perry. The pit women against each other phrase Swift directed 
towards Minaj is paraphrased by parrying her own seemingly shade strewn tweet in two words. Oh, snap. Oh, oh, and Perry also wants a shout out to Rihanna. The real travesty is where is the shine for uh, hashtag BBHMM video when VMA eligibility period was from June 7, 2014 to July 1st, 2015, and that gem dropped on uh, July 15th. Swift has not further comment on Tuesday's incident while Minaj has spent much of Wednesday promoting articles defending her views on Twitter. Both superstars have declined Billboard's request for comment. And in a related story, newscaster and X Factor star Piers Morgan has weighed in on the Nicki Minaj versus Taylor Swift Twitter exchange that occurred on Tuesday when Minaj complained about not getting a MTV Video Music Award nom for Video of the Year. In an op-ed written for the Daily Mail, Morgan denounced Nip Minaj for her tweets in an article titled, Don't Play the Race or Skinny Cards, Miss Minaj. You're just a stroppy little piece of work whose video wasn't as good as Taylor Swift's. Morgan is responding to the series of tweets Minaj wrote Tuesday, expressing her anger that Adaconda was not nominated for Video of the Year. Minaj says that she would have been nominated if she was a different kind of artist and that other girls with videos impacted culture get nominated. According to Morgan, Minaj believes the reason she was snubbed was that she was A, black, and B, not skinny enough. Morgan writes, the target of her tempestuous tirade was self-evident Taylor Swift, who did get nominated in the Video of the Year category, along with eight other nominations, is both white and skinny. When Swift confronted Minaj about her complaints, Morgan said Minaj lied when she insisted the tweets weren't about Swift at all. Morgan then chastised black Twitter for collectively leaping on Swift, causing her to be eaten alive. Morgan was himself criticized on Twitter yesterday after tweeting, hashtag all lives matter, all lives matter, in response to the hashtag black lives matter hashtag morgan said i have every sympathy for with taylor who did absolutely nothing wrong and i have no sympathy with Nicki minaj who emerges as a whiny brat that just doesn't like losing he also added uh, her charges of racism and big bodyism are frankly laughable when you consider that three of her of the five nominations for video of the year are black artists and one of them is beyonce whose own body is far more aligned to the minaj school or physical beauty than t- taylor swift Morgan also recounted a story when Minaj refused to meet his sons when she performed on America's Got Talent, referring to the singer as a stroppy little piece of work. He said that while she is talented, playing the race card is a cheap piece of thought outrage deliberately designed to stir up unnecessary racial tensions where it shouldn't exist. Hours after Meek Mill's girlfriend, Nicki Minaj, defended herself against Taylor Swift on Twitter, Mill started his own social media stir by calling out Drake on Tuesday. The Philly rapper claimed that Drake doesn't write his own raps, and if he had known that earlier, he would have not asked the superstar MC to guess on his recent album. Um, He said, stop complaining Drake to me, too. He doesn't write his own raps. That's why he ain't tweet my album, because we found out. Mill alleged after firing off a few tweets. The whole game knows for real. They scared the, t- the truth. I can't walk to, I can't wait to those, to these guys and sit back and act like they don't know. Mill acknowledged that fellow rap stars J. Cole and Kendrick Lamar really know how to rap, but piled on Drake by writing that even though they're in different lanes, dude is always, uh, is all the way out of it. LOL, he added. He ain't even right that version on my album and I would have known if I would have took it off my album. I don't trick my fans. LOL. Along with dissing Drake, Mill called out Safari Samuels and ex of Minaj for twerking in a new video clip. This N S B was twerking man. I've always thought you was gay letting your girl do all that shit with uh, with ends while y'all were together. LOL Mill wrote. Drake is featured on the song Rico from Mill's recent number one album, Dreams with Worth More Than Money. The single comes in at number 16 on this week's hot R&B hip-hop songs chart on Billboard, while All Eyes on You, Mill's new single featuring Minaj and Chris Brown, bumps up to number 28 on the Hot 100 charts. 
According to Argentina, has revoked an arrest warrant that was issued for Justin Bieber for a 2013 incident in Buenos Aires. The decision was confirmed Wednesday by a court official familiar with the case who spoke on conditions of anonymity because they were not authorized to provide such information. Judge Alberto Julio Banos had earlier ordered the immediate detention of Bieber and two of his bodyguards. Bieber was accused of sending the bodyguards to attack a photographer outside of Buenos Aires nightclub during the 2013 South American tour. On the same trip, he apologized for defiling the Argentinian flag on stage and got into trouble with police for allegedly spraying graffiti in Brazil and Colombia. Bieber never returned to Argentina to respond to questions about the incident. And now here's the top 10 songs on the, hot, on the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts for the week of August 1st. Number 10, The Weekend with The Hills. Number 9, Major Lazar and DJ Snake featuring M. Zero with Lean On. Number eight, Rachel Patton with Fight Song. Number seven, Walk the Moon with Shut Up and Dance. Number six, Fetty Wap with Trap Queen. Number five, Salento with Watch Me. Number four, Taylor Swift featuring Kendrick Lamar with Bad Blood. Number three, Wiz Khalifa featuring Charlie Poof with See You Again. Number two, Ken, uh, The Weeknd with Can't Me Feel My Face. And again, the number one song on the Billboard Hot 100 singles charts is Omi with Cheerleader. And now let's look back at what happened on this date in entertainment history. On this date in 1982, actor Vic Murrow and two child actors, Renee Shin Chen and Micah Dean Lee, were killed in an accident involving a helicopter during filming on the California set of Twilight Zone, the movie. Murrow, who was 53, and the children ages 6 and 7 were shooting a Vietnam War battle scene in which they were supposed to be running from a pursuing helicopter. Special effects explosions on the set caused the pilot of the low-flying craft to lose control and crash into the three victims. The accident took place on the film's last scheduled day of shooting. Twilight Zone's co-director John Landis and four other men working on the film, including the special effects coordinator and the helicopter pilot, were charged with involuntary manslaughter. According to the 1987 New York Times report, it was the first time a film director faced criminal charges for events that occurred while making a movie. During the subsequent trial, the defense maintained the crash was an accident that could, not, could, that could have not been predicted while the prosecution claimed Landis and his crew had been reckless and violating laws regarding child actors, including regulations about their working conditions and hours. Following an emotional 10-month trial, a jury acquitted all five defendants in 1987. The families of the three victims filed lawsuits against Landis, Warner Brothers, and Twilight Zone co-director and producer Steven Spielberg that were settled for undisclosed amounts. The, the Twilight Zone, the movie, was released in the summer of 1983. The film, which received mixed reviews, was based on the popular sci-fi TV series of the same name that aired from 1959 to 1964 and was created by Rod Serling. In the movie, four directors, Landis, Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, and George Miller, each adapted a different episode of the TV series, which chronicled the stories of people who found themselves in highly unusual situations. Murrow, who had previously appeared in numerous television shows and such films as The Blackboard Jungle in 1955 and The Bad News Bears in 1976. He was the father of actress Jennifer Jason Leigh. And on this date, in 1988, Guns N' Roses made popular breakthrough with Sweet Child of Mine. In the 80s, Los Angeles was a mecca for so-called glam rock bands and the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle which they came to be associated. On any given night inside the clubs like the Troubadour and Whiskey A Go Go, you can not only hear bands like Hanoi Rocks and Motley Crue, or later Winger and Roaring, but you could also witness an expression of that lifestyle as decadent as any of the music world had seen. The rise of grunge bands like Nirvana and Alternative Rock effectively put an end to that scene in the early 1990s, but the first blow was a struck by one of its own, Guns N' Roses, the band that made its big popular breakthrough on January 23, 1988, where, when their first hit single, Sweet Child of Mine, entered the Billboard Top 40. To the guys in pop metal groups like Poison, Guns N' Roses might have seen at first to be just another fellow hair band, but Axl Rose and the rest of the classic GNR lineup, Slash, Izzy Straden, Doug McHagan, and Steven Adler were interested in rock and roll that was much more raw, angry, and honest than what the pop metal bands were playing. Originally formed out of the ashes of two other groups, LA Guns and Hollywood Rose, 
Guns N' Roses played in a style that owed much more to the pure hard rock of the 1970s than the sh- showy heavy metal of the 1980s. Signed to Geffen Records in 1986, GNR released their first full-length album, Appetite for Destruction, the following summer, and with it, their debut single, Welcome to the Jungle. Appetite for Destruction would eventually be certified 15 times platinum, and Welcome to the Jungle would become a massively popular top 10 hit, but neither the album nor its single was an immediate success. It took nearly a year of touring and the release of a second single, Sweet Child Mine, to earn Guns N' Roses uh, a place in music history. Built around an opening riff that GNR guitarist slash considerably a silly throwaway, Sweet Child of Mine went on to become not only just a number one hit on this day in 1988, but also a true rock classic. Voted one of the great on greatest lists by Rolling Stone, Blender, the R.I., Double A, BBC, and the like. Sweet Child of Mine made stars out of Guns N' Roses, and it made so-called power ballots like Poison's Every Rose Has Its Thorn seem weak by comparison. And that is your entertainment report for Thursday, July 23rd, 2015. I'm your host, Mr. Downtown Ray Mello. I'll be back to wrap up the week tomorrow, delivering some major stories and trends going on in the world of entertainment and beyond. You can follow the show on Facebook or on Twitter, facebook.com slash the entertainment report with Ray Mello. That's R-A-Y-M-E-L-O or on Twitter at The Enter Report. You can listen to this episode or any previous episodes of The Entertainment Report with Ray Mello on iHeartRadio. Just go to iHeart.com, search for The Entertainment Report, and it'll take you to the page. Good night, and God bless you all.